Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Sly with ProPlanner, and today we're going to cover uh, some details, intro actually, and then details of the Flow Planner application. So, Flow Planner is a material flow diagramming and analysis tool that works on top of the AutoCAD platform. And one of the reasons, let me just close my email here. Uh, Okay. Notifications down. One of the reasons that uh, we do develop the application inside of the AutoCAD platform is many of your layouts are in AutoCAD. If not, getting a layout in AutoCAD through DXF, it works very well. Some of our customers also will import a layout drawing as an image, which is also possible in AutoCAD, and scale the image according to uh, the proper scale factor, which we'll talk about in a moment. So it's a, a real world scale in the CAD system. And that way we can uh, overlay our flow lines for our aisles, our location labels for our uh, locations in the facility that we're drawing flow diagrams to and, and work with an image. So getting uh, either, as I mentioned, a photo or uh, a CAD model into AutoCAD or, or even drawing it in AutoCAD if, uh, if you wish to use AutoCAD as your tool, it is fairly easy to do. I also wanted to mention that the Flow Planner application does require the full AutoCAD license. So um, you can't use AutoCAD Lite if you have AutoCAD LT. Uh, that won't work because it doesn't support the programming uh, environment. On the other hand, uh, the Flow Planner application does have an option. I think it's about $1,000. Uh, to uh, embed the 2D version of AutoCAD inside of it. So what that means is if you don't have AutoCAD, uh, you don't have to go out and spend five or 6,000 for an AutoCAD license. You can just simply use the uh, engine that, that we provide, it's called the OEM engine, and we'll plug that in for you. Once again, it's 2D only, but for obviously the facilities work that we're doing, that, that works out really well. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the application and just kind of give you an overview of, of what it does, and how, how it works here. I'm gonna just pan over here just to kind of give us an image. I'm gonna work with the tutorial because it's available for you as well when you first get the application. So it'll be something familiar to you. We're going to start with the CAD part of flow diagramming and then we're gonna back into the data. I realize it's a little bit backwards because you're going to need to start with where does my data come from? But I think you'll have a little bit more perspective on the data once we start looking at what you do with the data. So what I have here, I've, I've gone in, I've, I've loaded AutoCAD, I've loaded my drawing. And let me talk a little bit about the scale of the drawing. When you're in AutoCAD, there is a command called units. And I'm just gonna type commands in because sometimes the menus change a little bit depending upon your version of AutoCAD. And uh, I noticed we did have a comment, uh, someone is having a difficult time hearing the presentation. So maybe Paige, you could assist uh, that individual with that. And I do wanna introduce Paige as moderating this meeting so uh, she can help you uh, her email is also page uh, at proplanner.com. That's P-A-I-G-E at proplanner.com. So we go into units and I press return here and you can see that the units, um, you have a number of choices. We prefer engineering if you're using foot inch or if you're using um, meters or millimeters as your base unit, we recommend decimal. So those are the two that we want you to use when using this application. I'm going to use, uh, and also uh, we'll, we'll show you where that relates to the flow planner application. If the drawing um, that you're loading in AutoCAD has a unit of decimal degrees, it's going to tell flow planner that the default unit is probably millimeters or meters if the drawing comes in architectural engineering, uh, then um, you'll be able to read that. Uh, it'll come in foot inch. So when you're using engineering, you definitely want inches to be your base scale factor. So it's very important that when I go to the, if I'm using engineering units, 
okay, and I go to my drawing, and I type the distance command, D-I-S-T, and I measure between two things. Usually I pick columns to measure between. So if I go this column here, roughly to that column here, I'm at about 50 feet, and that is correct. That's where I should be uh, for this drawing. So that tells me that this drawing is uh, correctly represented for the scale factor, okay? Now the same thing's gonna be true when you're using millimeters and meters you're going to need to go in and make sure that when you measure from one to another, whatever your base unit is, because decimal units is just gonna give you a decimal number, but that decimal number corresponds to your base unit. Now you might ask, well, what is my base unit? Well, when I go into the flow planner application, I go to settings, you can see that I have my drawing units as inches. Otherwise I can choose meters or millimeters. So if you want your drawings base unit, to be meters, that's fine. Draw everything to meters and therefore each unit is one meter. Otherwise you would draw your drawing and each unit is one millimeter. That's very important to have the drawing units correct. And that corresponds once again to the units command in AutoCAD. The output units is what the software calculates. So of course, if my drawing units are inches, my output units are going to be feet. Uh, meters is an option, but we don't recommend doing that. It's pretty confusing. So uh, if you're using inches, use feet. If you're using millimeters or, or meters, you're going to want to use the output units of meters. So we'll come back to some of these other parameters uh, here in just a moment. But I wanted to uh, focus on uh, just getting the drawing correct to get started. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to load a routing file for uh, the flows that we want to diagram. And this is an Excel file. It's actually a CSV, comma separated values file. In the United States, those are actually common separating the fields, and we'll look at those in a moment. But if, in other countries, it's typically a semicolon. Uh, if, for example, uh, the decimal point is, is not used as a delimiter in your number, um, so those countries will use a comma, therefore a semicolon needs to be their delimiter. But in the United States, uh, we do see the uh, delimiter typically being uh, the decimal point, well, always the decimal point, and therefore commas work fine. And Excel will do that too. When you save your file, if you're in a country where the units uh, are different, where a decimal point for a number is actually a comma, it will use, even though it's a CSV file, it will use a semicolon. The, uh, uh, looks like we're getting a question about connection quality. So let me just double check here real quick. Back on the topic of the structure of the file, we have a small pump, we have a medium pump and a large pump. I've just created my first level material flow aggregation in the spreadsheet where the first column represents a category of flow. Now, a lot of times that's gonna be based on a particular product type. And that's important because we're going to color code and more importantly, we're going to summarize or what we call aggregate our flows according to this first grouping. So the when, when I'm talking about the um, product, it doesn't have to be a product. Oftentimes it is, and in this case, small pump, large pump, and medium pump is. But for some people, a product is a type of material flow that they may want to separate or quantify from another type of material flow. It could be a whole family of products, not a particular product. Within this particular flow grouping that we're going to calculate by, we have what we call parts. And, and really, the parts aren't as important as the fact that these are flow routes. Now, of course, I can specify a part ID for that flow route if I want to. And, and typically you would in a, in a product part organization of this file. For that particular part, we're identifying the from location, we're identifying the to location, and then what we call a via location. Now, a via location is most often an intermediate storage location between the from and the to. So for example, in this case, if I'm coming from receiving and I'm going to assembly, 
I might have a receiving storage or supermarket out on the floor. The reason that we do that is uh, as a via location is that we can easily ignore via locations to see what would happen if we were to deliver material directly. In other words, ignore this offline storage location. So that's typically, or that was the original purpose of the via location between a from and a to. Now, uh, uh, you can also use the via location as just a, another drop point for the material. So you could go, um, you could say I'm going from receiving to uh, sub-assembly one and then to final assembly line. Uh, the via location doesn't have any real special relevance other than the fact that uh, it is just a location between the from and the to. But most often the, the original point was the via was an intermediate storage area. And so I can quickly see that in some cases I'm going from metal stamping to welding directly, where in this case I'm going from receiving to assembly one via the storage two location. Now, the next thing that we're looking at is the percent of flow. We're identifying that all of the flow is taking this particular route for this product large pump. We're also identifying the type of container. The containers I move per trip and the number of parts in each of those containers. So as a result, in this particular case, I'm moving 600 parts at a time between these locations. Two containers, 300 parts per container. This helps the application determine the number of trips that are required to go between those locations. And that will be very important as we look at total distance and time, which are key factors that we're analyzing. So let's look at the location IDs next. We've referenced receiving, hand finishing, bore, metal stamping. In fact, if I pull these down here, you can see that I have many locations referenced that I can go to and from. And I can add new locations on the fly if I wish to. Um, and I can even change these. I can edit in this environment. Although it's not the best editing environment, we recommend that when it comes to editing your data that you do most of that in Excel because it's obviously excellent for that. Or in many uh, clients, they'll generate this file automatically from another system. Now there are a number of tabs at the top. The locations tab at the top uh, shows me all the unique locations that are found in the drawing or in the routing file. That's important to note. You know, in this case, all these locations were found in the drawing because there's actually an X and a Y value for them. But in the uh, initial case, when you come into a drawing, you may find that there is no X and Y coordinate value. And we'll do one of those here in just a moment. In that case, the software will ask you to place uh, a tag where that location is in your layout, in your drawing, and the software will use that location when doing its calculation. So I wanna say that one more time. This list of locations that you're looking at on the locations tab is collectively all the locations that found in the drawing on a layer you specify, which if we go to the settings tab, we've identified as PP locations which is where it's looking for these location tags. Also, this list of locations is all of the uniquely named locations that you referenced in your routing file. So it's both. It's the aggregation of those two is what this list represents, okay? So, Let's just start off simple, and I usually like to start off simple. When I do flow studies, I always do what I call straight flow studies, just so that I can make sure that I'm not missing something. Then I'll go in and have the program do the aisle-based flow studies as well. So I just did a straight flow study, and there are really two things that we're gonna be looking at here. One is the calculation that did. Notice this word aggregate. Aggregate means that the software summarized the total distances and time and cost by this flow grouping, which I call small pump. It's all the flows of the small pumps that I make as opposed to a particular product. Large pump, medium pump, those are the three categories I have. So I've summarized all my flows. I have my costs. I also have the quantity of moves, uh, that's what we're looking at in terms of trips that we're taking, that. not individual trips per move, but the types of moves that we have, the flow routes that we have that it has analyzed. 
And then the other thing you'll notice is the software is calculated travel distance, but it has also calculated travel time, and it also loaded the load and load time. And so we have a total time. And when we look at the travel percent, that basically is saying what percent of the total time of the move is made up of driving, actually moving from A to B. And in this case, you can see only 20% is. Now this is gonna get bigger when we start doing aisle-based flows. Right now we're just doing straight flows. So we've underrepresented the uh, time to make the move. But one thing you'll notice in flow studies pretty quickly is that while travel distance is important, handling time at both ends of that distance is also very, very important. And typically can make up between a third to 50% of the total travel. So we can't ignore travel or handling when we look do material handling studies. Some of the other stats that we can see here that it's calculating is our average trip time, which in this case is just about two thirds of a minute, our minimum trip time, our maximum trip time, the, the standard deviation of that, the, the travel part of the trip time, that's the moving part, and the handling part of our trip time, which is the pickup and the set down, which in this case is half a minute. Okay? And that's all on a per trip basis. So that's the stats that we get. And the methods tab is where we are specifying the types of devices we have and the instances of devices. And I'll talk about that in, in, when we get, in just a moment when we get back to it. But I, uh, right now we have cranes and carts and forklifts and we have some speeds of those devices, some availabilities, a number of devices and so on, as well as a 15 second pickup and a 15 second set down. So I did mention that the handling time was half a minute and that half a minute came from the 15 seconds to pick up a load and the 15 seconds to set down a load those to add up to 30 seconds, which is half a minute. So when I said that the average travel time must be only, you know, the remaining 0.17, almost 20% uh, of a minute or around 12 seconds. So let's uh, uh, take a look at the diagram. So you can see in this case, we have a lot of flow lines. And when we're talking about aggregation, if I have one of these flow categories, small pumps, large pumps, or medium pumps, pumps that go between two locations. And I have many different products in that flow category going between those locations. I'm going to represent them by one line and I'm gonna scale the thickness of the line according to the aggregated number of trips. So let me give you a case in point. So I have a lot of material that goes, that appears between these two lines. And so to, to work with the AutoCAD drawing, right now the focus of the application is on this editor. If I say go to AutoCAD, which is a button here, I'm now in the AutoCAD window. Now I, I changed my focus, but I need to actually click in the AutoCAD environment for my cursor to change so that I can use the AutoCAD uh, selection. To go back to the editor, for flows or to do calculations to get back into the focus of the flow planner application from the focus of AutoCAD. I simply select the return button and now I'm back to the focus of flow planner. So while flow planner is working inside AutoCAD, the two need to kind of have a dominant focus. One's taking over for another. Now there are certain cases where they both run concurrently, but from a user entry perspective, one of the two has to be dominant. So right now the flow planner application is dominant when I select go to AutoCAD and click in the AutoCAD environment. Now the AutoCAD environment is dominant and I can do different things. Now I still have this little editor here, uh, part of the editor and I can query paths. So I could click on this flow path here, right click and you can see that that's from receiving the storage one. Now there may be many different movements of the large pump category aggregate from receiving the storage one. There could be 30 different parts that go between those two. But collectively for the large pump, there are 2,700 trips between these two. Okay. Now I, I selected, I did the query path and I selected a path by just clicking on the edge of the path. To get a path, you need to click on the outer edge. You can see here when I'm, my cursor is on one edge or outer edge, I'm selecting when my cursor is in the middle, I'm not. I can also do a crossing window. Now in AutoCAD, if you click a point and you move up and to the right, you get this solid box. If I move up and to the left, I get this dash box. Now a dash box is called a crossing window, which means anything I touch will be selected. 
where in this solid box, I have to fully enclose something for it to be selected. Now, why I'm mentioning that is if I click here and I go up into the left with my dashed window, I'm touching a bunch of flow lines. I can touch other geometry as well. That's not a problem. When I hit return, it gives me all the different flow lines between there. Now you can notice in this case, I have both medium pump, large pump, and even small pump between those locations. So receiving the storage, all three categories of flow. Now you can see for each of those categories, well, aggregates is what they're called, um, we have different frequencies and they're also gonna be shown in different colors. And we'll see that here in just a moment. So 750 trips contributing to medium pump, 2700 to large pump and 500 to small pump. And this is the total frequency of trips that's been calculated. I, if I want to, I can also right click in here and copy that and put it, take it to Excel if I want, which you can do for most of the inputs in the flow planner application. Now, I mentioned to you that each of these aggregates is shown by a different color. Uh, when you go to the products tab, you can specify what color you want your aggregate to be mapped to. So you just click on it and you go down here and you specify what color that you want to see it in. So if I want to change this to magenta, I could do that. I select the update button here when I make a change and you can see the update button has changed in the background AutoCAD that particular aggregate to magenta. When I go to the reports tab, I do have the ability to generate a typical textual report, an ASCII report as you might think of it as. But I can also use this tab to generate a legend in the drawing. I'm gonna generate a fairly large text size. I'll do 36 inches high for my legend. I'll do a product-based legend. We'll talk about some of the other aggregates in a moment. And I'll insert the legend over here. And so you can see that the purple lines represent the medium pump, the red lines represent the small pump, a few of those, and the yellow lines represent the large pump. Those lines are on top of one another. So within an aggregate, we sum them up to determine the thickness of the path, but um, each aggregate's flow lines are drawn independently, which means they become on top of one another. So once again, within the large pump, we have this yellow, thick yellow line representing all the different moves within large pump. But between the aggregates, large, medium, and small pump, we have flow lines on top of one another. Uh, that allows us to do some filtering if I want to go to the filters tab and turn off everything but the large pump, I can do that. And then I select the filter flows button and I'm now only looking at large pump flows. So it's filtered those off. I can simply come back and turn maybe medium pump on, large pump off, turn that off. And you can see now I'm just looking at the medium pump flows. Those are basically drawn on different layers. So I'm turning the layers on independently when I do that. Alternatively, I can filter based upon um, the from two locations as well. So uh, I think I'll just set both of these to none. I'm gonna go from, let's say anything to and from storage one. So this is to from storage one and to storage one, that's gonna be uh, no flow lines. But if I select the or, that means anything coming into storage one or leaving storage one. It's a very handy filter we use quite a bit. So if I was looking at moving storage one, I can see the impacts. And, and right now storage one must be right down in here in this middle area. Okay. So, and I can show all flows to turn all the flows back on. We can do the same thing with storage two. And you can see a little bit better that storage two down here is where the stuff's coming in and out. And like I said, this is very helpful because it lets us identify maybe where something should be moved from or where it should be moved to. The other thing you'll notice is the thickness of the lines is dependent upon the amount of flow that we have and how we've scaled those flow lines. So when I go to the paths tab in the application, I can change this scale factor. If I make this number larger, I'm basically incorporating more inches of size of the drawing per trip. So the flow lines get larger. So if this were to go to 10, you'd see, and I hit update, I'm now having 10 inches of width per trip. Now that's 10 inches in actual scale on the floor. So that makes for a pretty thick flow line. And the arrows are scaled according to the thickness of the flow line. So if I think my arrows are too big, I can change my arrows down to two times the path width instead of five times the path width, update them, and you can see the arrows get quite a bit smaller. 
depends on what it is that you're looking for. I can also delete the arrows entirely on the flow lines. In this case, I actually might want to go the other way. I might want to change more to a path thickness of three so it doesn't become as, uh, it doesn't cover as much of my drawing. Um, it makes it therefore easier to see. All right, we mentioned these locations. The paths are already are, are being routed to and from these locations. These locations are just AutoCAD text. That's it, nothing special. There are no special objects or anything. They're AutoCAD text drawn on the layer PP locations. I went to the settings tab and looked at what layer it's looking for. So that's how the locations tab knows where these locations are. If I go uh, here, I can also change the size of these location labels on that layer. So if I want to make them a little easier to see, I can make the text type 12 and I can pick update. And you can see, uh, actually they got smaller because they were bigger, let's do 48. And you can see those text labels get quite a bit larger. And I, right now the layer that they're drawn on is the PP locations layer. So they're coming in as white. I can go into AutoCAD and change that locator layer if I want to. When I'm using tuggers or if I use grouping on locations, I can establish groups for locations. I can set color that way as well. So what are groups of locations? Well, right now I've created a welding group, a machining group, a stamping group, an assembly group. You just create whatever groups you want for locations. And then you can map your locations to that group. So you can see these particular locations, if I select them, are all mapped to the assembly group. If I wanted to, I could say, well, hand finishing should be an assembly as well. I click on it, it already is, but I go down to my group list, I pick assembly, I say update, and of course those are mapped, which they already were. If I choose to color code by my group now and update, you can see that all my text labels are now color code, coded according to what color was assigned to the group that that location was mapped to. In this case, we see some purple, we see some yellow, and we see some red. So working with locations and helping you identify where they are is, is pretty easy to do. The other thing to note is that those locations can be moved uh, independent of the drawing. I mean, I could go into AutoCAD as I've just done, and I can just grab that one storage two location. I can say, well, what if I moved storage two you know, up over into this area? Or what if I move storage two over right into the center here? And I don't have to move all those flow paths. Some people though, when they do that, will use a crossing window. And in that particular case, um, if I did a move and I pick the end of these lines with a crossing window in AutoCAD, as well as that workplace, selecting objects, there's my crossing window. Okay, hit return and then ask for a base point. I pick a point where that location was. Then wherever I move, I can, I can stretch these out, okay? But most of the time you don't have to worry about that because the program is gonna regenerate it. I've moved storage two. The paths are still going to the old location of storage two until I recalculate, at which point they're updated and my new distances and times are updated as well. So this is a little bit about straight flow. So we can query the paths, we can auto-generate the paths, the path distances are used to calculate our distance and time of travel. Time is calculated by the device we called out in the routing, the speed of the device that we choose to use. In this case, I'm using 15 feet per second. Okay, and a load time of 15 seconds load and 15 seconds unload. Now, let me talk a little bit about the methods and then we'll go in and do an IO based analysis. So with the methods, uh, I have method types and I have methods. Method types are always devices. So I have carts, I have forklifts, I have cranes. They have different speeds, they have different fixed and variable costs. They have different Excel rates, Excel, D cell. Typically on this case, five feet per second is pretty good for a fork truck. And a five foot per second per second acceleration, deceleration, in other words, Excel, decel about the same speed of the device works pretty well as well, okay? So this is typically where I start with my default. Now you can certainly do a uh, time study on the floor 
to validate your straight speed for your XL decel, what you're really looking for is in what distance do they start decelerating and how long does it take for them to get to stop, right? Which like I said, it's five feet per second. They can usually stop in maybe two or three seconds. So um, in this case, that would be one second. So I could do a little bit slower XL decel if I wanted to, but once again, it's not gonna be as critical uh, of a value. The most critical value is your load and load time. How long does it really take to acquire and to dispose of a uh, load on that device? Now I say device, the methods can also be devices as they're shown in this case, or the methods can even be people or groups of people. And that's how I've seen it used very effectively. So in this case, I might change green to be Bill because this is Bill's moves in the factory. Bill runs that device. And so when I say that that's Bill, um, what I'm basically saying is in my part routings tab, when I go to those particular moves, and I think I have them uh, here, you can see that this particular load is moved by Bill. Or that could be the North Fork Truck drivers, or it could be the uh, driver in assembly area six. So if I go to methods and I go to cart, this could be um assembly line one okay update that's the people that are actually running that device so that could be people or that could be groups of drivers and then we have them mapped to equipment and those individuals in working in the area that they're assigned to for these flow routings could essentially then have their own load on load times and right now i've hard coded the load time and the unload time we'll talk about processes here in just a moment so when I'm doing the calculation, the time is calculated by the speed of the device and the number of trips and the distance it got from the drawing. But one other factor that's very important is this one here called effectiveness. Now effectiveness is the percent of time that that device travels with a load. So if you were to do a work sampling study, if you were to go out on the floor and observe your equipment, and notice that half the time it's traveling with a load and half of the time it's not, it's deadheading to go get another load, then I would say the equipment would be 50% effective. So I'm actually gonna change all of these to 50% effective, which means for every one foot of productive travel from A to B, I'm going to add a foot. The software is going to add a foot to that to take into account the time for deadheading or coming back empty. Now, when I do my calculation, you'll notice that my distances will go up quite a bit. In fact, you can see I'm now overutilized on some of these devices. I'm, I'm, it's asking me to add more equipment, but I'm not going to in this case. And you can see that it's substantially increased our distances and our time. You can also see that our travel percent went from around 20% now to almost 70% of the travel because we're taking into account that deadheading that back trip. Okay, let's take a look at aisle-based flow. So I've, I spent quite a bit of time talking about how to specify locations, how to group locations, how to color code them, how to do the same thing with flows. And we can see how the software can easily find those locations in the drawing and draw flow lines between them. But how about the aisles? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the paths tab. I'm just gonna erase all the drawing paths just to kind of get them out of my way for right now. I have AutoCAD drawing and I have text labels. Now what I need to do is draw aisles where material can go. And some of them are already drawn in this case. I'm gonna to go to the Pass tab. I'm gonna to go to the Add Edit button, and I'm going to add lines. Now, all I'm doing is adding lines on an AutoCAD layer. So if you know AutoCAD, you can just go to that layer and draw lines. The important thing is that those lines are not polylines. They need to be actual individual lines. So I'm going to go ahead and add a line, which is just using the AutoCAD line command, and I can draw lines wherever I want. Now, one of the things I wanna highlight is when I draw a line, you can see I'm drawing a really weird line here right now, I'm identifying where material can travel. So I'm assuming that material can take this route. The other thing I'm doing is wherever that line crosses another line, an intersection is assumed. And I wanna highlight something that's very important with this application. And that is that when you end a line, don't just try to get super accurate to this one little point here, uh, to the intersection. Yes, you can snap, if you're familiar with AutoCAD, you can snap to that particular location but it's really not necessary. 
it's better to just overshoot it because the software isn't going to go to this tail anyway. It's always going to go to the intersection and then around. The, the problem is that you can sometimes have a risk where you don't come all the way. This is not an intersection. It looks like it when I zoom way out, but that isn't an intersection. So you'll wonder why the software isn't taking that route. It's probably because that line isn't actually crossing the other one. So just a hint there, make sure your lines co totally cross, you'll find a lot less frustration. The other key thing to recognize is that this is a 2D drawing. So that could be a line with a Z coordinate different at both ends or a Z coordinate that, that it isn't zero. It's very important when you're drawing lines, remember that AutoCAD lines can be 3D. Even in our OEM version, you could draw a 3D line. So it's important to recognize the fact that the lines should be have a zero coordinate at both ends. So if you're having problems with intersections, not making sense, check that. Now, the next thing you got to look at is how does this, the operator, the driver, get from degreasing to the aisle network? This is what we call a join line. Now, you can go to, and this has to be very accurately done. You would need to uh, object snap to the insertion point of this text object in AutoCAD and draw a line to the aisle network. And you can do that if you want. And if there are particular routes you want to take, you can go to AutoCAD on the aisle network that whatever layer, uh, aisle line, whatever uh, layer you specified, in this case, PF aisle path, for your aisles, you can draw these lines by hand. But that's very, very time consuming. It's usually best to let the software do it. And I should mention the fact that when I'm going to draw these lines, and I'll go back to Flow Planner here, the um, Methods tab, your device type, specify your layer. So I said what layer to use when you draw your lines. In this case, all devices are using this one layer. But you could map different AutoCAD layers to different device types. What that means is, my hand carts could have a different aisle network that my forklifts do, that my cranes do, right? Obviously, a crane's probably going to be able to go anywhere at once. So that's important to note. The other thing is, if you do have multiple aisle networks and you want the software to look at the aisle congestion collectively for all devices on all different aisle networks, it's very important that these aisle lines are drawn directly on top of one another in each of those layers. So what I typically do is take my most busy aisle network, such as maybe my forklift, and then I copy that AutoCAD layer to another layer and edit it, okay, to define the aisle network for another device. That way I'm sure that this aisle line is totally overlapping another aisle line. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Now, once you've drawn these aisles, the next thing you need to do is to join your locations to those aisles. And that's what we do on the Pass tab. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase the aisle joins at the moment. I'm just gonna erase all aisle joins. And you may notice that there are no red lines now connecting any text label to the aisle network. So to join those, I say add, edit, uh, sorry, turn this, I say join locations to aisle. And when I hit okay, you can see that the software generated these red lines connecting all of the aisle networks. Now, you'll notice they're red lines, and in this case, the aisle network is shown as purple. That's because the layer that they're drawn on is red and the layer is purple. So that means you can go into AutoCAD and change that color if you want to. But it's nice to have them in separate colors because it helps identify them. This join line is actually drawn on the layer name, in this case, PF aisle path, dash aisle join. Okay, so in other words, it's a layer that starts with the layer name of the aisle network and then ends with this join path. So it's on a different layer, those lines, and that's important. I'll show you why. Well, first of all, it's important because the software knows it can delete anything on that layer. When I erase the aisle joins, it knew it could delete anything on the aisle join layer for that aisle path. And then when it joins them, it knows it can put them on that layer. Now, once those have all been connected, then I can go into the software and say aisle flow and calculate, and the software will go ahead and um, calculate my distances. You can see I'm getting a lot more distances here uh, on that aisle network. And now my distances are substantively larger. And you can see the percent of time that I'm traveling versus loading and loading now is hitting almost 80%. We're in the upper 70%. So this is much more realistic. I have my load time. I have my unload time. I have my travel time. I have my deadhead time. I'm taking into account the aisle network. 
Now, one thing that's important to note is I don't have acceleration deceleration turned on. If I click on this and then recalculate, you'll see it's going to get bigger yet. I'm now 77% because the additional time it takes to accelerate and decelerate. Now, when do I accelerate and decelerate? Well, I obviously accelerate when I take off at my first point and I decelerate into my last point. But if I'm going around a corner or I'm making a turn greater than a certain angle, the software, or sorry, less than a certain angle, um, the software is going to assume that it has to come to a stop and then start up again. So what is that angle? Well, when I go to the methods tab, you can see that I have an angle here of um, five degrees. That's probably not good. Probably anything less than 120 degrees, okay, is going to constitute a turn. So that's what I'm going to define. Certainly anything less than maybe 100 degrees would be a turn where you'd have to stop in the fade. And now when I go in and I recalculate, anything less than that, um, that many degrees is going to uh, do a turn. And you can see now I'm at almost 80% because I didn't have too many five degree turns. Um, this case, anything less than 120 degrees is now gonna constitute a turn. And that's what I'm now demonstrating. Okay, the other thing that's important to note is that the device did travel up and down those join lines. In other words, the fork truck actually drove into the workplace in the car. And for some of your devices, that may be exactly what you wanna do. For other devices, maybe they just stop at the aisle and the person walks into the workplace. So in that particular case, what you can do is in the settings tab, you want to define a walk speed. If this walk speed is zero, this isn't going to work. You need to have a walk speed for the operator. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say ignore aisle join lines. And what that does is ignore them from the flow planner calculation of the device, which then tells the software to allocate that pickup and set down distance, the walking distance, into the workplace and back out to the aisle it's going to add that to the load and load time. So now when I calculate, you'll see that my diagram is different. I'm not driving the device into that area anymore, into the red line. The red lines don't have flow lines on them. My flow travel distance of my device will go down, but my handling distance will go up, okay? Which means the traveling distances now went down to 76% and I have more handling time. So what the software did is it took the distance of that join line times two, because I'm walking in and walking back at the speed that I'm walking, five feet per second, okay, to actually um, add that to the handling time. And I say add that to the handling time. So that's being added to the 15 seconds. So in order to not double count, you need to make sure not to include that, okay? So that is a quick overview of aisle-based analysis. The last thing I wanna mention is if I go to my, uh, normally in the software, you are creating your aisle congestion, that's a default, to see the aisle congestion, because we do have flow lines on top of lines, we don't really get a view of how much traffic is really going up and down these particular aisles. I can go into the PAS tab and I can specify aisle congestion, and now I'm looking at the aisle congestion diagram, which of course the paths are so thick, I can't even make them out. So I need to make them thinner. So I'm gonna change the scale factor down to one. And now you can see them a little bit better. In fact, in this case, I might even need to go down to 0.5 uh, so that they come out a little bit better. So you can see those are my aisle congestions. Now you may ask yourself, well, how much many trips does that really represent? Well, once again, I can go to AutoCAD and I can query that path and I can click on this line here and I can see that that represents around 34,000 trips. Okay. Now, the other thing that I could do, uh, just like before, I could go to the reports tab and I can insert a legend on congestion, which is the default since the last diagram I generated was congestion. And you can see from this particular case, anything that's red is 32,000 to 34,000 trips and that's yellow is 29 to 32 and so on. 
The other thing I can do is go to the congestion frequency tab and change those factors. Right now I'm using these percentages, but I could change those percentages. I could see that red represents anything that's 10%. And then maybe I is also 10%, okay. Or I can make this 20%, make this 20%, okay, and update, okay. The diagrams are going to update, and when I recalculate that, that's going to be updated. And when I go to see my PAS tab for congestion, that will be updated. And then I do need to update my legend and just reinsert the legend and it will recalculate those breakdowns, okay? So now my color coding and my path thicknesses for the congestion analysis while well corresponds to a different frequency congestion breakdown. One other thing that's important to note here is processes. And I'm not gonna have really uh, time to talk about giving you a bunch of examples of processes, although they aren't super hard to do. But what I wanna have you take a look at is uh, the help for processes. And I noticed on online help, this is context sensitive help. It did take you to the PDF file section on this. You can use predetermined time systems and reference them there. But I think what's most important is templates. So what, what do templates do? Well, well, templates basically highlight the, um, the load and the stop time of a move. So base time says six seconds at the stop and nine seconds per container. So if I'm delivering multiple containers at that location per stop, if I have four containers I'm delivering for that move, 10 containers I'm delivering for that move, then it's gonna multiply that container quantity by this time and then add the stop time. So instead of just a flat 15 seconds where I've got one container or 50 containers, I can now be a lot more accurate. Another thing that you can do is specify time through location uh, area. In other words, if I'm in the assembly area, use this base time and time per container. But if I'm at the dock area, use a different one. Or if I'm in some staging area, use a different base time and per container time. I can also do it by container type. So if I have a pallet, use this base time and per pallet time. If I have a blue tub, use this stop time and per container time. And then I can combine them. I could create uh, something that looks like this. So base time of four seconds per stop, zero per container, plus if the container is full, and that's what CF means, CE means an empty container, CX means I don't care. That applies to both full and empty containers at locations as well as full and empty by container type. So if I have a full tub, add three seconds per stop. If I have an empty tub, add one second per stop and one second per container. And if I'm at a location with an empty container that's at the dock, subtract two seconds per stop. So in other words, you can get pretty fancy with these templates. They're simply defined here. And then the idea is that I will create a, um, so if I wanted to create this process here, uh, I could simply say uh, the process type name, uh, I'm just gonna call this Dave. Uh, and then my activity description could be BT six slash six and update, oh, sorry, add, and uh, I've added that. And then in the methods tab, I basically can go in and reference that I wanna use Dave for this. And then it's going to use that template in calculating that when I do my next calculation. So pretty simple. This, this particular case isn't gonna make a big difference. Okay, I now wanna talk about the data files. You know, I'm running a little bit longer than time than I thought. So let's go right to the data files of this study. So I'm gonna go into uh, the directory where this location is, or this data is stored. And let's just take a look at the uh, tutorial here. So let's go to the planner. Let's go to flow planner. Right. 
And let's go to one of our samples here. I had this directory here, but I didn't have it. I got that. I just lost my my directory where I was at. Right. Let's go in this way then. In the tutorials section of the application, you can see we have tutorial files in here. We have our foot inch, foot inch tugger metric, and we'll talk about tuggers in a separate session. We're in the unit load section, and here's the hydro pump CSV that I'm looking at right here. Now, two things about this file. First of all, it's just a standard CSV Excel file. Columns A through R are input columns. Column S afterwards, actually what Flow Planner does when you save your study is it actually writes the calculated results for that row in column S onwards, which is ignored when you load this file. So you, you can delete this, that's fine. But it's handy in that if you have an application that writes out the locations that you want to calculate this flow statistics for, and you do your calculation, you save it, then those output results are put right back into that same file. So you can load that into another application. That way the two are in sync. So you can see the distance it got from the drawing, the frequency it got, the load and load time, the travel time, the via distance, via frequency, that's the distance and frequency to the via location. And then our input data. I mentioned to you that the first column is this flow grouping. The one thing about this file that's important is this needs to be contiguous. What I mean is that you need to sort it so that this column is all together and this column is all together. It makes loading the file much easier and quicker. And then of course, the rest of this is just the actual flows uh, for that particular flow grouping. Once again, 100% of flow, um, the method that we use, once again, that's the driver's name, the from location, the to location. If you have a via location, if not, leave it empty the containers per trip, the parts in a container, as I mentioned before, and the container name and the method name. This does bring up one more point that I wanted to show you in the drawing when we look at this flow file. I'll go back to the flow planner here, is when I do an aggregate, one of the common aggregates that people like to do, and let me just reload that file here. is to aggregate by method. You can aggregate by many of these different things. Now, why would you want to do by method? Well, you can see in this case now, if these were different driver groups, if this was Bill, if this was Sandy, if this was the assembly two driver group, I now get my statistics of time and distance by individual. So this can help with some of your labor analysis and it's a very common use of the tool. The other nice thing is that when I look at my flow diagrams now, I can see where Bill and Sandy and, and others may go. So the file is very simple. Now the file, if, if you notice when I went to that directory that I was just at, there's actually a few files. The material handling data is stored in, in a, also a text file called MHE. Now by default, it won't let you open it. You need to specify an application. You can specify Excel. Some people put a .csv at the end of this, .mhe.csv, so they can load and edit it. I just loaded it in Notepad. You can see it's also ASCII text data. Same thing with the product quantities. So if you wanted to change the amount of flow for one flow grouping or another, or the color for that, that can also be changed. This makes it very easy to integrate this flow planner application to some of your other data systems that do analysis of flow. The results are likewise, when you, if you save them, that view file, that results file that we were viewing in here, the show results button was showing you, that information is actually stored in the RES file uh, that we're looking at right here, okay? So that, that information we give, I didn't, I didn't save the results recently. In addition, even the location information is available. And that could be helpful if you wanna use these XY coordinates 
or these mappings of location IDs to groups or edit that information and save it in the application once again externally. So the material hanging equipment, the location data, the product quantity data, and the results, as well as the fact that in the application itself, the results are also stored, um, oddly enough, in the same input file that you created. When it writes this file back out, it writes it out with this data over here on the right that you can use for subsequent analysis. I realize I've gone a little over time here. I wanted just to see if there were any general questions that anyone had in the group um, before I end this particular tutorial. And as usual, if there are additional questions that you have, certainly email me at dave at proplanner.com. I'd be very happy to address your questions there. And then you can also um, set up a separate time if you'd like uh, to answer any specific questions you might have uh, for your application. That said, we'll end this particular webinar here, and I hope to see you at our other webinars, uh, once again, starting this time next week.